uh, it causes you to act. So people that say, well, I got revelation. Well, there should be accompanying that revelation. There should be some action. Hallelujah. And, and just to cite you an example, when Saul laid in the dust on the road to Damascus, and he hears, he's heard the voice, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer comes back, I am Jesus. And uh, the, immediately the response, when that revelation comes from God to Saul, is, What would you have me to do? And he goes into Damascus, and within three days, God will have visited him. A man of God will have come to him. He will have been baptized. Uh, he'll been filled with the Spirit of God. And so, people that speak about revelation, uh, when they say, okay, I've received revelation, just ask them, okay, what has God told you to do? You understand? Uh, a lot of people like to toss that word around. And uh, revelation is always accompanied by action. Hallelujah. And so, just, just remember that this morning. We're going to talk... <laughs> We're going to talk <clears throat> from the Old Testament today. Uh, there are some outstanding men in the Old Testament, and there are women too. But uh, there's two of them that uh, many of, our, of us are aware of, uh, and that's Jonathan and David. They stand out. Uh, they should have been probably in the terms of how people, how competitive people are. Today they should have been enemies, but they were united by one thing. And that one thing they both loved with all their hearts. And so they would become very, very close. In fact, uh, the scripture would actually say that the, the, the love that these two men had surpassed the love of a woman. Uh, and, of course, all those deviates that think sexually all the time and uh, everything has to pertain to some sexual intimacy uh, just don't understand what uh, what the scripture is trying to say are you still with me if I if I lost you already and uh, amen there's just when uh, you can you be, can be so deeply enmeshed in the same purpose that you recognize in somebody else that they have the same goals and the same heart that you have uh, it seems in the scripture that David far outshines Jonathan, at least, in the exploits that you read about. But I'd I just like to take you back to the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel uh, for a few moments. Uh, chapter 14, verse number 1. Uh, <clears throat> there are some things that are said about Jonathan in the Bible uh, that are very notable. Uh, he is a man, a man who is following his father. Uh, it, uh, for Jonathan, I am just amazed at, at, at him and how he walks that tight wire rope of having a love and a loyalty for his father and on the same side having a love for David, whom his father develops a deep hatred for and and somehow Jonathan is able to to survive all this and and walk in a very righteous way I I'm just I'm talking to you right now uh, we live in a world that uh, there's a lot of confusion going on a lot of things are, are spoken and just just remember uh, loyalty is very important all right Learning to be loyal. Amen. Learning to stand and uh, back those that have supported or you have supported with, with all your heart. Amen. It, it, it's a valuable thing. Amen. And so Jonathan is one of these kind of men. He just he stands out in the scripture, of course, being the son of Saul. Their, their enemy is is. The Philistines, and as you, if you read in the scripture, there will be repeated battles over and 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 over, and over again. 
Amen. It just seems that you can't, can't just keep the Philistines down. And uh, I'm just, just hang out with me here. Uh, we're not home yet, ladies and gentlemen. And if you are content to believe that you have had to fight your last battle, uh, I, I'm telling you, you're sadly mistaken this morning that we're going to fight many battles before we, amen, are raptured home. Many battles. Many battles. And many of those battles will be against the same enemy. He just keeps showing up on the scene, amen, with all his ugliness. And he comes again to kill and destroy. And so Jonathan is a man that uh, follows his father. Uh, he is in line to be the king of Israel. Uh, and he is not a slouch. And so many times when you read in the scripture in the Old Testament, Saul seems to be a man who has lost direction. All right, he's lost direction. Uh, he doesn't seem to know what to do. Uh, obviously, uh, you get to the 15th chapter, uh, you see this so plainly because he now, amen, has been rejected by God and the throne has been ripped out of his hands and will be given to a better man than himself. Uh, Saul is like a lot of believers today who don't seek God, who don't uh, pray, uh, don't have really what you'd call a relationship with God. Oh, they, they come to church and amen, they even read the Bible and they say their devotions, but, but it's, but it's a, a, a relationship that's so important. It's from relationship that we will get direction. Are, are you with me? Am I, I'm just yakking right now, you know, just hang out with me. It's from relationship that we get direction. Okay, just a hit and miss uh, kind of walk with God is not going to give you direction. Amen. You're going to just stumble around. And uh, Saul was that kind of a man. But he has a son who has a heart. For Israel and and so they are just sort of in a place where Saul is in his tent which you seem to find him in a lot and uh, and they've gone out to battle the Philistines and and it's, it's so bad that even Israelites have abandoned Saul and joined the other side not that they love the Philistines but they just want to be on the winning side and so at that time in the history of Israel, the only people that have swords are Saul and Jonathan. Everybody else has had to take their their sickles and their farm implements and somehow get them ready to, to fight a war. And I would suggest that they're probably not the best implements for, for warfare, but that's just how it is. But Jonathan has a sword, and so he and his armor bearer in chapter 14 have gone out. Okay, and if you, we don't have time to read this whole passage of scripture, but the area that they're in is very, like there are just craggy uh, uh, cliffs, you know, and it's straight up, and it's, it's a difficult area, and the Philistines are on the high ground. And Jonathan and his armor bearer are on the low ground. And so, let's go down to verse 6. While everybody else is being inactive, okay, you've got uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they've been having a discussion. And in their discussion, verse 6, uh, Jonathan said to this young man, Come, let us... Go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Yeah, for nothing restrains the Lord uh, from saving by many or by few. All right. And so David said, let's, let's just go out there and check things out. You know, God can work through us. Okay. Now, <clears throat> just, just hang out with me. All right. Some of us, we use the excuse that we are too inexperienced. All right, we we've never really been in a battle. We've we're, we're we're just you know we're just new to this thing and and uh, you know and 
But I, I like an attitude that says, you know what, I may have never done this before, but I'm going to try. All right? I, I like that kind of attitude. Young people, are you hearing me this morning? Amen. You may, you may be able to fall back on the excuse that you've never done this kind of thing before, but, but you know what, I like those people who say, you know what, I'm going to try. I'm just going to go out there and see what I, what I can do here. Are, are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? And we as adults will do the same thing. We will uh, we just, we'll make up excuses why we can't do it. And, of course, the first one we fall back on is our lack of ability or experience in this area. But Jonathan says, you know what? Let's just go out there and check these boys out. Now, I like, we don't know his armor bearer's name. But he, he's got the same kind of spirit Jonathan has for he he says to Jonathan he says uh, uh, let's see here oh I had it here a moment ago thank you somebody's with me seven so his armor bearer says do all that's in your heart go then here I am with you according to your heart in other words he says Jonathan you want to do this thing I'm I'm right with you let's just go out there and do it, it, it it's music to somebody's ears who wants to do something for God when somebody else comes alongside and says, you know what, I'm with you on the deal, man. Well, how much experience you got at this thing? This is my first battle. But I'm willing to go up the mountain with you. Hallelujah. Oh, God, give us people, amen, that they may be inexperienced. They may not be, quote, unquote, qualified. But, amen, they just want to go to war. They just want to fight. Amen. And they just want to learn. You see, everybody's got to fight their first battle. You understand? Nobody comes into this thing with experience. You learn. This is one of those hands-on kind of learning business. You know, you can, you can have somebody teach you, and you can have a preacher tell you what to expect, but this is a hands-on learning business. You just get out there. You get your, amen, you get yourself dirty. You get yourself bloody. And out of that, you, you learn how, amen, to work for God. Amen. Too many people want just a classroom experience. They just want everything in the test tube. Amen. And I just want to get out there and see how it works. Praise God. Come on. Come on. How many of you just enjoy having firecrackers, amen, sitting on a shelf? Amen. No. If you got some matches, I want to see how this thing works. No, I'm not suggesting we do that here in Wisconsin. But I want to see how this thing works, you see. Amen. It's not good enough just to have a package of black cats. Amen. I want to, you know, I want to go out there and see how much noise I can make. Bottle rockets. <clears throat> I want to see if they really do take off, you know. Yeah, some of us so want an experience with God that is all classroom. You know, classroom's tidy. You get to bring an apple for the teacher, and I, where's my apple? You know, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. Uh, honey crisp. Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you're going to get an apple, you get one of the better ones, man. All right. And uh, now I'm caught up in apples here. I was doing good till I got the apples. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, amen. We, we want that kind of class. We just want to sit and we don't want to get our hands dirty. We, we, we just, we want, we want to listen to somebody else's story about what they've done. You know, aren't, aren't you tired of hearing somebody else's story? Aren't you tired of hearing, amen, what somebody else, you know, everybody that's ever done anything for God has just got out of the classroom and got out there where people are at and where battles going on, and they just got into it. Aren't you tired of sitting on the sidelines and, and, and watching somebody else, you know, and then they come back in and they're sweating and they're bloodied, but they got a grin on their face and they're saying, boy, we routed him today, man. He fled down the road today. Amen. I, don't, don't, isn't that what you want? Is that the kind of experience you want with God? Or you just want one where you just, amen. You know, you're like the guy that enjoys the fish story. No, I like a fish story. But I also like to be there when the fish gets caught. You understand? 
That's just a little different. Well, this armor bearer, Jonathan, he's that kind of a man. Jonathan, you know, I, this is my first, I'm your armor bearer. Uh, I, I don't know how I even got this assignment here, but I got it. And I like you, Jonathan, and you seem to be a brave man. And, hey, man, I, I hope you've been practicing with that sword because I feel we're going to be having to use it in just a few moments here. Amen. And so, and so they are positioned for God to use them. Uh, just, just hang out with me. Many people of God have not positioned themselves to be used by God. What do you mean, Pastor? You're not positioned in this house. The only battle you'll have in this place is with your brothers and sisters. And ah, we, we, we do well at that, don't we? We like to bloody each other up all the time. But you see, we're not the enemy here. You understand? The enemy's out there. And he's got captives out there. But we, we like it in here because it's safe in here. We, you know, we got to get out there. You know, you got to position yourself for God to use you. We got to learn to pray every day, God, bring me into somebody's life that doesn't know you. Help me, God. To, come on, brothers and sisters. Isn't that not the heartbeat of God? The, does not the word of God say he came to seek and to save that which is lost? Amen. I'm not here just to get blessings from God. That's why a lot of us want to live. We want to, oh, amen, we're excited about the blessings. I want to be excited about the man or the woman or the young person that I meet out in the street somewhere that wants God and wants to change and, and wants to believe God and is tired of how they're living. Amen. And, and are willing, amen, to give them. So that's, that's the kind of, amen, situation I want to be in. I don't want to. I don't even like the smell of a hospital. I've been in the doctor's office, man, and you smell almost like antiseptic smell. You know, every time I go to a stinking doctor, every time they weigh me, you know, I want to tell them, you know what, I already know how much I weigh. Why don't you just leave me alone? <laughs> but they're trying to help me. You know, just we just we just want to we just want to stay in the boundaries of safety. Jonathan and, and, and his armor bearer are not like that at all. I, I don't even know how far I'm going to get today, to tell you the truth. You know, but I, I pray that just there come on us a spirit like the spirit that was on Jonathan and his armor bearer. And the armor bearer would tell Jonathan, do all that's in your heart. I'm, I'm with you. So they, they got to come up with a plan. So it's verse 8. Very well, let us cross over to, to these men and we'll show ourselves to them. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you. Then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they... Say thus, come up to us, and we will go up. The Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. You know, it keeps coming to my mind. It's a trap! Okay, I'm sorry. You, you, I probably don't think like it. It's two of them, but it's a trap! All right. Okay. Hallelujah. I lost my help. All right, all right. So now... So what do they do? Verse 11. So the both of them show themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. Uh, here we are. I keep thinking it's a trap, man. It's a trap. You, you only see two of them, but it's a trap. All right. Okay, you're not even with me on that. All right. It's, I guess it's for me. And the Philistines again respond in verse number 11. Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. In other words, they're very derogative towards them. All right. Okay, just, there's so much, man. You, you, know, you know what we can fall into, brothers and sisters? We want the acceptance of our world. All right. We, we want them to really love us and like us. And, 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 and I, you got to understand what, what I'm trying to say this morning. I, I'm, I'm not saying that people out there won't love us and like us, but I, if if what if what motivates you is their acceptance and and them 
saying high praises to you. That, that, that's, that's not very good. That's, that's not a good place to be. When the devil starts saying nice things about you, <clears throat> I, I, whose side are you on? <laughs> you know, I, I question whose side you're on if the devil's saying nice things about you. Every time the devil sees us as God's people, he ought to be wringing his hands and saying, my God, I wish they would just leave me alone. You know, they keep harassing me. Uh, uh, okay, okay. You want to get the devil off your back? You want to get the devil off your back? Do something for God. It's just, what do you mean get the, you 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 get out there and do something for God, and the and the devil is now having to go in a defensive stance. Okay. When when, when somebody goes into a defensive position, they're no longer attacking. They're under attack. If 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 your walk with God's all about the devil attacking you, you know what you're telling me. You're, you're telling me you're hunkered down in the foxhole. All right? And you're just letting him pound the living daylights out of you. All right? So you know what you need to do? First of all, you need to get out of the foxhole. And you need to go towards the enemy. Because once you begin to come on, what does the Bible teach us, ladies and gentlemen? Does it not say that greater is in he that's in us than he that's in the world? Well, that's what we get in the classroom. We all feel greater in the classroom. We all feel powerful in the classroom. Man, we, we all say good things, man. Come on, we, we, we just whip that devil. We're in the classroom. But once we get out in the front lines, what are we saying then? You see, what, 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 what's our conversation then? My God, if I can only make it till morning. You, you want to change the posture of your enemy, move towards him. That makes him uncomfortable. If he's got you in a foxhole, then he's, he knows where you're at. And, he, and you see, in a foxhole, you're pretty predictable. All right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Is this, is this, am I being too militaristic this morning? Is this over your head? Yeah. Once you get out of a foxhole and begin to move forward, now he's got to change what he's doing. You understand? Too many believers Live in a foxhole. You make your foxhole comfortable. You got your microwave in your foxhole. You even dug a latrine in your foxhole. You got your refrigerator there. In other words, what, what you really, you don't plan on leaving the foxhole, you see, because the foxhole's real comfortable. When the church at Jerusalem got under pressure, they had two alternatives. Hunker down, which some of them did. Amen. And just let the devil beat the living daylights out of them or doing something about it. And the Bible says they scattered. Now we think of scattered as they fled. But no, no, you read the Bible. It actually says when they scattered, guess what they did? They spread the word of God. Now the devil's got a, if he's got you in the foxhole, he's comfortable. It's when you get out of that foxhole that he doesn't know what you're going to do. You know, I've heard the testimonies of people, the devil's been chasing me all week. The only reason he's chasing you is because you haven't stopped. Running. And the Bible does say stand still. There's a reason you do that. You stand still to see the salvation of the Lord. You've you got to remember whose battle this really is. Does not the word of God say that the battle is the Lord's? 
So if I get out of my foxhole and get out there, my God is right there with me. He's accompanying me. He is going to do a work. Okay. Is this, is this, again, I'm not going to even get to David right now because I'm, I'm just stuck on Jonathan. And so the enemy is very derogative. And so the enemy, again, is, well, <laughs> look at, they're finally coming out of their holes. Okay. And so uh, the Bible tells us that they begin verse, let's see, verse number 12. Uh, oh, God. You got it. You got to see what verse twelve. Okay, now, verse twelve. Then the men of the garrison called Jonathan, his armor bearer, and said, "Come up to us, and we will show you something." <laughs> and Jonathan said to his armor bearer, "Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel." Now he hasn't started up the craggy cliff yet. But in his mind, it's already a victory. You understand? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't know. I'm not sure you understand this. One of the things that David and Jonathan have in common is they've recognized who they are. Okay? It is both David and Jonathan that will use the term the uncircumcised or circumcised Philistine. All right. Both of them use that term. W what does that mean? It means that if you're not circumcised, you're not in covenant with God. All right. And uh, that means so much to be covenant with God. And, and just, this is what we need to understand. We need to have an understanding of our identity. We're not a bunch of nobodies. You know. Yes, it does say that not many mighty are called. And not many noble. We we weren't the slickest group, you know, but we have this great God that can take us and make us and shape us into mighty warriors. Hallelujah. You know, and, and oh, who are we? My God. We're an army. If you only think the army's sitting right here, you ain't got it. We are all over the world. All right? And we are winning victory after victory after victory. Amen. The devil has a problem and he knows he has a problem. Because there is a church that knows who they are. And they're not content to stay in a foxhole. Amen. Can, can you imagine what it must be to be a missionary? To go to a country where there's not another believer that you're aware of. To walk into a nation. Amen. And for many of our missionaries of the past. The very first couple years they were on the mission field, they had to learn the language. But these hardy men and women of God got out of a comfort zone because God had called them and they went to places, amen, that was, you know what, I, I just saw uh, Brother McLean is in Nigeria. And they got, you got to see the, I should show you the, no, I ain't showing you. Amen. This will really increase your appetite today. 
but it shows them with these deep fried maggots. And, 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 then, and then it says it. These are a delicacy. Well, hallelujah. I just believe in sharing. In fact, I feel real generous today. You can go ahead and have all mine. <laughs> hallelujah. I just feel that generous. But see, so you go into a culture where you don't know the culture is not your food, your family's not. Do you, you understand? I, I know communication is so much improved. But when my uncle and aunt went to Brazil in the early 60s, you didn't have, you know, reach out and touch someone. You know, you, you, you sent letters. And, and I remember my mom getting a letter. And in the letter, my aunt told her that, you know what, you know, the, just the communication is not good because you see over whoever they're U.S. It wasn't U.S. mail. It was Brazilian mail. You know, if they got behind on the mail, they just burned the mail. I caught up today. What'd you do? I just had me the biggest bonfire I've ever had. I'm all caught up, up, but you know. And so communications were sporadic. But they went out there and they did something for God. And God proved to be faithful. I don't have it here today, but I, I should, sh if I can remember someday, I got it at home. It shows a dedication of the church in Rio de Janeiro, amen, where my where my uncle pastored and started a Bible school. And, and uh, there at one time was nothing there. Hallelujah. But you see, he, he didn't stay home. Brothers and sisters, we may never end up across the, 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 the seas. But do you understand? We have a mission field in Kenosha. And we got an enemy that's saying, Stay in your foxhole. And the moment we come out, he immediately begins to become derogative towards us. Oh, you really think you can change things? When you start hearing that kind of language, you know you can change things because that's exactly how the devil speaks. Amen. He wants to keep you hunkered down. He wants to keep you doing nothing for God. And I like the spirit of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Hey, let's see what God will do. Let's just show ourselves to the enemy. And he says, come on up and say, oh, we got this one. This is a one victory. Hallelujah. No, I ain't getting to John David today. I can tell you that right now. Hallelujah. And so they came out of their holes. And they started climbing that craggy cliff to get to the enemy. Brothers and sisters, we have discipleship teams, not just to, to give you something to do, but to help you to impact our world, to discipline ourselves, to, to do something for God together, you know, to, to not be content to stay like it is. For many of us in this room, we have exhausted everybody in what we call our oikos, okay? Our oikos are people that we have relationship. Unless you get a new job, unless you, you, you move to a new neighborhood, or you get new relatives. The third one, I suggest, doesn't happen very often. You, you pretty much have said something to those that are in your family, all right? And... Uh, and they know where you go to church. and Many of them know what you believe. Many of them perhaps have come to the house of God. But you just, if, if all that matters to you is just your family being saved, I, uh, that's not the heart of God. In fact, I'm going to say something ugly here. If that's all that matters to you today, it's just your family being saved there's a good possibility your family's not going to be saved. All right? 
because it takes an act of God working in the lives of your family for them to be saved. Okay, and the, and the truth be known, for many of us, it wasn't our testimony that brought our family. It was the testimony of others around us who helped and increased the pot potential for them to come to God. It, it seems that what God does is he sees just how interested you are in the field. And when he sees your interest in the field, he begins to work on your family. In other words, if I stay in my foxhole, okay, I'm not trying to be ugly here. There's a, there's a greater potential that my family will not know God. It's when I get out of my foxhole. Now, I understand that you want your family to be one to God. That I, I'm all for that, and you, and you should be all for that. But I'm here to tell you, if you only focus on those that you love the most, there's a God that loves the whole world. And so I remember the words of Sister oh, Riddle. I remember the words of Sister Riddle. She stood in this pulpit many years ago, and they had her and her husband had been in the Cameroons, and they'd come back, and they were they were uh, going out on to to raise more money to go back. And her father, who was not a believer, got sick, and she was she was torn. I need to be with my father, who doesn't know God, but yet I also need to do God's work. What do I do? Okay. So obviously she began to pray. You know, I, I would not fault her for going home to be with her father. I mean, I would have no issue with that myself. But do you know what God told her? You take care of my business, and I'll take care of yours. You see, that's God works like that. I'm going just, to just say this to you. I'm going to just say this to you. The devil will bring up enough trouble to you to keep you occupied and not do the work of God. You just got to get to a place, say, yeah, I got issues, I got, but I'm going to do the work of God. And as you do the work of God, God works in your situations. We are so centered on ourselves. Jonathan could have done what all Israel was doing, but he wasn't content. In fact, do you know that his dad was sitting in the tent and come up with the brilliant plan? We're all fasting tomorrow. Did you know that? Well, we're going to covenant ourselves with God. We're going to fast tomorrow. Well, that's real brilliant, Saul. You're in the midst of going to war, and you're telling all the boys to fast? The boys are going to expend their energies. They're going to get tired. You know, you know they, they didn't have tanks and trucks to move. Every, they got to run on their feet. And, and you're in a hilly region. You ever, you ever climbed up a hill? And, and and expended your energies, it don't take long. And you got to have something in the factory of your body, amen, to produce the energy that you need to accomplish what needs to be. So he, we're all fast. Oh, we're so dedicated to God, we're going to fast tomorrow. But Jonathan goes up the hill, and, and if you'll read the story, something happens. When he gets over the lip of that edge, something happens. Amen. First of all, they, they, they what are they, I think it's about 20 men die. Somebody got that. Somebody follow me close and know the story well and could actually do better. At tea. About, you know, was it 20? 20 men die. And, and, and something happens to the Philistines. All of a sudden, these guys have been, oh, they come out of their holes. They're, they're, they're now trying to find a hole. Okay, and, and the Bible says that they begin to melt away. Now, now here's here's the thing. 
Here's the thing about the enemy. Here's, here's the rest of Israel. Amen. Hunkered down and worrying. And, and all of a sudden, somebody notices some outpost. Notices, hey, the enemy's melting away. Something's going on. And, they, and so they, they take a quick survey, opinion poll. Who's still here? One guy's missing. Jonathan's not here. Jonathan, he's not here. His armor. You know, you, you see, it just took, God just took one man with an armor bearer to bring a victory to Israel. Who would not be content to stay in his hole. That's the kind of spirit I want to have today. Amen. I, I, I don't want to hunker. Have, has anybody here not got any issues and problems? Don't raise your hand. Every last one of us is going to deal with stuff. And some of it's going to be pretty critical stuff. So you got a choice. The enemy can say, okay, you stay in your hole. I love it when you're in the hole. But when you come up the side of the hill, things change. Hallelujah. Things change. There was a trembling in the camp. Praise God. All right, this, this is where I'm, I'm going to end here. Amen. So Jonathan brought a great victory. Now, Jonathan gets overlooked most of the time because immediately we focus on David and David's defeat of Goliath. But there was a young man named Jonathan in chapter 14 who had a heart just like David's heart, who was not content for the status quo of survival. Let's stand in this room. I pray this morning that as believe, I pray that our young people would understand that you don't have to wait until you're beautiful like me and old 61 before you do something for God. You don't have to wait until, amen, you, you got an edumacation. You don't have to wait. You have to wait to get your driver's license. You don't even have to wait to get a job. Your parents may want you to get a job, but you can actually do something for God where you're at right now. You just got to come out of the foxhole. And when the enemy taunts you, don't back down. God has just given me the victory. I'm coming up the hill for you now. And watch what the enemy does when you start up the hill. Hallelujah. Can we just call on him right now in this room? Thank you, Jesus. For a man like Jonathan who would lay out for us what it means to fight. He's the only one that, him and his father, the only one that had a sword. And daddy was sitting on his sword in the tent. But Jonathan took his sword and put it to good use. My God, help us, oh God, to put what you've given to us to good use, God. We can hunker down in a hole somewhere and hide. And the enemy taunts us and it just doesn't get any better. Or we can just come out of the hole and go up the side of the cliff and attack the enemy. Hallelujah. Oh, God, raise up men and women in this congregation that will go take the battle to the enemy in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. It's no wonder Jonathan had a heart like David's heart. Hallelujah. It's no wonder that when he met David, they, were, they just were knit together because they were men of the same spirit. Hallelujah. They believed in God, and they wanted to do something for that God that they believed in. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you this morning. God bless you.